Okay, as I'm sure none of you know who this next speaker is, he's fairly new to the scene. Um, he likes pirates, long walks on the beach, and singing. <laughs> no, really, honestly, I've introduced JT so many times, I'm quite frankly out of material and embarrassing stories. Well, maybe not the embarrassing stories, but there's a reason why we don't share those. Okay, so next on the stage, JT Eberhard. Hi, Skepticon. How many first timers out there? Damn. Well, before I, before I start, um, I get to tour around the country and speak at conventions, which is cool, which means I get in for free. But if I didn't do the whole speaker thing, I wouldn't be able to go to a lot of these. Skepticon is free, so everyone can come in because this staff puts together a year's worth of full-time work for nothing for you guys with no thought of profit. So why don't you guys come to your feet and give them a round of applause for putting in the effort for this. <laughs> now sit down, we're on the clock. All right. I'm JT Eberhard. I write the blog, What Would JT Do, uh, over at Patheos. I recently left Freethought Blogs, but I still consider myself an honorary Freethought blogger, and Freethought Blogs is the straight up shiz. You should check it out. Um, I want to recognize some of the contributors to my site. Uh, my lovely girlfriend, Michaelin, is right over here. She contributes. Steven Olson is a contributor to my site. Dr. David Berger is here, and Christina Stevens and Anne, my legal writer, are all here. Guys, I'm glad you're here to see this. Um, yay! Also want to announce, forthcoming, behold, there will be a What Would JT Do podcast. For those of you who like podcasts, it will be hosted by Stephen Olson and Christina Stevens. If you guys have ideas for anything you want to hear, if you're one of the celebrity speakers here and want to appear on the show, email the blog at whatwouldjtdo21 at gmail.com. Okay. Um, at Skepticon 3, a few years ago, that's bright. At Skepticon 3, a few years ago... I wrote and delivered what has become my most popular talk. It was called Dear Christian. It was a discussion with a hypothetical Christian in which I addressed a lot of the arguments I'd heard after going to church for a year. And whenever they sang, I wouldn't sing. And whenever they bowed their heads to pray, I wouldn't pray. And so they'd always come up to me after church and say, hey, you're new here. What's your name? And I said, I'm JT the Atheist. How are you? <laughs> and they'd try to convert me. And uh, that talk addressed all of the arguments uh, I received over that year. And so I want to write a second one this year. I wrote Dear Christian 2, The Reckoning. <laughs> and this one, once again, speaks to a lot of Christians out there, and I'm hoping to speak uh, through YouTube to a lot of them. To those Christians, I often don't think you behave in a way that suggests you believe what you believe. If most of us were to find a guy hanging off the edge of a cliff, struggling to get back up, about to fall to his death, that person would become our entire life. Every thought we had would be devoted to rescuing this human being. But to a Christian, literally every single person in this room and an increasingly large number of the population are so much worse off than hanging over a cliff. We're hanging over the precipice of hell. And how often do they make that their entire world? How often is that the most important thing to rescue those people? It tells me they believe in God a lot less than they believe in the cliff. So this is my message to those Christians. Come with us. Take my hand. Because God has abandoned you. In the discussion of whether or not God exists, God could have given the Christian every conceivable advantage. And he didn't do it. He gave that to us. But that's just the start of how God has abandoned you, dear Christian. Now, why do I care? Why do I care if God has abandoned you? Why do I care if he's abandoned humanity? Why do I care if what you believe is true, if it makes you so happy? I care because that is the only moral thing I can do, and I'll explain why. The young girl you see there in the green t-shirt, her name was Madeline Newman. 
Those are parents right down here in the, what would be your lower right. At one point, Madeline, who is 11 years old, fell incredibly sick, wound up curled up on her bed for weeks at a time, with her breath becoming shallow, with her skin becoming pale, running a fever. For weeks this happened, doubled over in agony, and at no point did her parents ever pick up the phone to summon an ambulance. And eventually, Madeline died of type 1 diabetes, a completely treatable condition. Now, if the word bad is to have any meaningful definition, parents who watch while their child dies are bad. But when I read this story, there's something that stuck out to me, and it was how similar I was to both of those parents. Because both of those parents loved their daughter as much as you and I would love our children. They wanted Madeline to get well just as much as any of us would want our child to get well. The fault with these two was not as Christianity would have us believe, that there's some intrinsic flaw with humanity that causes us to be evil. The problem was just that they had bad ideas about how the universe worked. And once they had those bad ideas, all the good intentions in the world weren't enough to save them. So what does this say to me? This tells me that if you have good intentions, which I think most people on this planet do, most Muslims, most Christians, most atheists, if you have good intentions, you have a moral obligation to try to be as reasonable as possible to make sure that your good intentions are then borne out in reality. Nobody sets out to watch their child die. And you never know ahead of time if your irrational beliefs are going to cause harm in some way that you couldn't foresee. As an atheist, as an agent of reason, or at least attempting to be an agent of reason, I want to root out irrationality before it does harm, not after. And that, dear Christian, is why I care about your beliefs. I care about your beliefs because beliefs are the gatekeepers of actions and they determine how you interact with me, with everybody in this room, and with your neighbors here on planet Earth. So let's talk about your beliefs. You always tell me that I need to choose to believe in God, that I need to choose to believe in Jesus. And I think that's asking the impossible. I don't think human beings choose their beliefs. I think your beliefs are the product of whatever facts are rattling around in your head and you're powerless to do anything else. And if you, if you don't believe me, imagine climbing to the top of this building, to the very edge, and trying to convince yourself by force of will that gravity doesn't work. There's not a single person in this room who could do it. There's not a single Christian out there who could do it. My mind is made up for me on gravity. My mind is made up for me on people rising from the dead. Even if I wanted to make that choice, I couldn't do it. And if God exists, he made me with that brain. He made me with that brain, and he made the gateway to heaven not based on my compassion, not based on how good I was, but on my ability to believe the absurd after making me with a brain incapable of doing so. God abandoned me in that way. And to anyone else who can't choose to believe that someone walked on water or that someone was converted into a pillar of salt, God abandoned them. God has left you, dear Christian, to defend his apathy. Anybody in this room, if they had the power, would feed the starving. They'd end suffering. But God has never done this. Now, what you, dear Christian, will tell me is that God doesn't want suffering to take place, but he also doesn't want to infringe on free will. And sometimes human beings do terrible things to one another. So is free will to blame? Now there's one quick and easy refutation to this. I think Sam Harris is the most recent to talk about it. There are lots of things that cause suffering and cause harm that have nothing to do with human beings being cruel to one another. Hurricanes are one of them. Katrina, Sandy, they did not discriminate. They killed lifelong Christians. They killed the children of lifelong Christians. 
killed atheists alike and spared atheists alike. If God disdains suffering, he would never make hurricanes. Now, what you might say is that God has given us the means to escape hurricanes, but if that's true, why make the hurricanes in the first place? That seems a little backwards to me. But when you talk about free will, what I always think of is why do we need malicious options in order to have free will? I mean, consider this building we're in. We have a bunch of options of things we can do with this building. We could kick the building. We could paint the building. We could pee on the building. <laughs> At which point, the people who own the building would exercise their free will and charge us a lot of money. And Officer Friendly would exercise his free will and give us a citation. What we can't do is we can't leap over the building. And you can't convert the building into a unicorn with the power of your mind. <laughs> but the inability to do the last two things doesn't infringe on your free will. Just because we don't have those options doesn't mean we don't still have choice amongst the options we have. We don't need every option in order to have choice. We just need options. So how does this reflect on actual human life? Well, in life, we have lots of things we can do. We can pet puppies. We can pray. We can pee on buildings. <laughs> we can snowboard. And we can have gay sex. <laughs> amongst other things. <laughs> but here's the deal. Gay sex is not necessarily a sin until God says so. It's not like God was stumbling through the cosmos and came across this rule that he didn't make. God makes the rules. So for some day, for whatever reason, he says, if you have gay sex, you're going to hell. <laughs> but then he leaves it there. As if we need this option in order to have choice. But we don't. He left us with the option of non-belief. Why? We can have choice without it. This is the behavior of a God who is trying to open up doorways to hell, not close them. He has abandoned us. And dear Christian, he has abandoned you. The next thing you'll hear is about free will is, but God wants us to have the choice to reject him. The choice to reject God's love or God's will is not the same as believing. God could have made belief as innate as hunger, as innate as our flight or flight or fight or flight response, and we would still have the choice to reject him. And I'm here to tell you right now, even if I knew that that God was the ultimate power in the universe, I would reject him out of hand. But <laughs> I hope somewhere Christopher Hitchens is smiling. <laughs> I would reject him out of hand. Dear Christian, you always conflate rejecting God with believing in him. But God could give us the informed choice. He could make belief innate so that we could actually make the choice and not have it reliant on my ability to believe in the absurd with no evidence, like people rising from the dead. So here's how it could have been. Entry to heaven could have been based on belief. Or it is based on belief according to Christian doctrine. It could have been based upon our compassion. I try to be a good person. I try to be charitable. I'm passionate about creating a better world. Yet, according to the Christian doctrine, someone like Osama bin Laden could have a deathbed conversion and wind up in heaven. If you can look me in the eye and say that I could go to hell while someone like Osama bin Laden or Fred Phelps, just for believing the right thing, could merit heaven or merit paradise, you have no concept of what justice means. <laughs> Dear Christian, look at these. Look at these and reflect on how any time you've ever told me that existence is proof of God's perfection. This existence is not perfect. Dear Christian, if you're like me, when you look at the picture of that starving child from earlier in this talk, your heart sinks. The moment you admit that you would feed the child that God wouldn't, you have 
admitted that this world is not perfect. And you have admitted that you could make it better than God. How much sense does that make? If a human being could conceive of a better world than God. What God could that be except a God that's abandoned us? And we do make the world better. We trust one another for comfort when we're sad. We trust each other to donate when we have cancer. We come together at conventions and give each other hugs and work for a better world. We do all the things that God hasn't shown up to do. And it's beautiful. We have more power to change this world than any God ever did. And so do you, dear Christian. So do you, dear Christian, every time you make a charitable donation, every time you make a, a, a contribution that's going to feed the hungry, you've done what God couldn't. Not only has God abandoned you, you are better than the God you imagine, and that is wonderful. Another thing you'll say to me is, but my belief in God has changed my life. I used to be, I used to be all hooked on drugs. Now I'm all hooked on the Lord. Or... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I used to be depressed, and now I'm better. But beliefs do change lives. Inaccurate beliefs change lives. If I believe that a monster is going to come out from under my bed and gnaw my legs off of the knee if I don't make a $50 donation every week to the United Way, I'm going to be a charitable person. I like my knees where they fucking are. But it says nothing to the existence of that monster. Dear Christian, I believe that your beliefs have changed your life. I really do. But I don't believe your beliefs are true. I just believe they've changed your life. And I believe that reason can change your life in a way that your faith never could. Human beings try our best to purge ignorance from our society. Our survival is based on our ability to do it. When God sends hurricanes, we invent satellite weather that announce the paths of hurricanes so we can evacuate the city. We have cell phones, laptops, clean water. No longer do we have to labor in the field or on the hunt for days at a time just to eat. And we can now spend that time with our family and our friends. By purging ignorance from humanity, we make the world a better place. That is how you change lives. So often, dear Christian, you say to me, you're trying to take away my hope. Why do you atheists want to destroy my hope? But real hope is based in reality. The hope you talk, to, talk about through faith is the hope of imagining that everything's going to be better without any effort on our part. And that's not how it works. If there is a meteor about to hit the planet and it eliminate all life, sure, you can pray and you can sit and hope that God's going to fix it. But the people who actually save us, who change our circumstances, are not the people who rely on God. They're the people who rely on this. They're the people who rely on just mortal minds, understanding reality to the best of our ability. And in that, we have become more powerful and greater masters of this planet than God ever was. The next thing you'll say to me is, but where does the universe come from if not from God? Where does life come from if not for God? And I don't know. I don't have the first clue. Neither do cosmologists. But neither, dear Christian, do you. As Richard Carrier famously, has famously said, or at least famously to me, because I love Richard Carrier, <laughs> there was once a time when nothing was explained. And ever since that time, everything we have explained Literally everything has been found to be the product of natural forces acting upon inanimate objects. All of it. The way uh, Aaron Raw puts it is, where the answer is known, science knows it. Where, the answer, where science does not know, neither does religion. If you guys are going to applaud, just like jump in and attack it. You got me guessing here. Do some dudes cheering back there. Okay, um, now I forgot where I was. <laughs> I 
the existence of understanding the world, the history of understanding the world, has been a one-way erosion of religion. There have been countless examples of where a religious answer has been replaced by a scientific answer. There has never been an example of when a scientific answer was replaced by a religious answer. It has always been the other way around every single time. When we didn't know how lightning worked, you said it was God's wrath or God's anger. Turns out it was natural forces acting upon inanimate objects. Argument from ignorance didn't really work out that well for earthquakes. I mean, can you imagine William Lane Craig before we learned about plate tectonics? Matter can't move itself, so there must be some intelligent being unbound by matter and science who could move this matter, and therefore God. Of course, it was just plate tectonics. The less we're ignorant, the greater the extent to which, to which we flourish. That's as simple as it gets. The less ignorant we are, the happier we are, the less we die the more pleasure we, f we find, the less time we have to spend working just to survive. By making arguments from ignorance, by making God the equivalent of ignorance, you necessarily set God against humanity. Either that God doesn't exist, or he's abandoned us, and he is our enemy. Whenever you say, we don't know something, that's where God resides, you have turned God into this quality that human beings must get rid of in order for our society to live, to thrive. That not only says a tremendous amount about what you think of God, it says a tremendous amount about the people who would worship that God. And yet, this is where God has left you, dear Christian. Within the ever crumbling ruins of human ignorance, that is where God lies. That is the weapons he has given you to argue with people like me, when he could have given you every advantage in the world. Join us. Join the atheist movement. Join me. We want to get rid of ignorance. Are we ignorant of some things? Sure. Are we unreasonable at times? Yes, atheists are. Sorry, atheists. But at least we're trying. We realize that irrationality is a moral failing. And if you join us in that, dear Christian, if you join us in believing that unreason is anathema to humanity, how can you believe that someone rose from the dead? How can you believe that someone walked on water? Now, don't think for a moment that I don't understand what it feels like to believe, because I do. My parents are here. I grew up in Mountain Home, Arkansas, a little podunk town in Arkansas. No light pollution. You could see the stars clearly any night there was no clouds. And I made use of that. I've always loved the stars. I've always loved physics. And I remember when I was younger and more foolish, believed in God as sincerely as anybody, and hated homosexuals and thought they were evil. I remember spending nights in my backyard looking up at the stars and thinking to myself that I was in some way in communion with God, that I was admiring God's handiwork, and the stars to me were beautiful. And then I went to college at Missouri State, a couple blocks that way. Oh, there's some locals and I audited some astronomy courses, and I learned about the genes instability, and I learned how to understand the vastness of the universe with logarithmic functions that would help me to appreciate the universe's size in ways that my brain couldn't. And the stars for me changed, and they became more beautiful. I believe, dear Christian, that you look at this world and you think it's beautiful and you believe that you are in some way communing with God. But to understand it as it really is, all the natural mechanics that make this universe the way it is, as much as our brains can, that's when it becomes truly beautiful. Understanding and knowledge, it's not just good for making sure that our good intentions are borne out in our actions. It's good for appreciating the world we live in and exploring it to the fullest. So what comes up next? Oh my God, if we don't have a soul and brains are just the product of matter, how can we even reason at all? 
This is one of the hottest arguments in religion right now, presuppositionalism, to which I have the following response. Matter, arranged in the proper way, can think and can reason. Here, check this out. Here's a bunch of parts. Can't perform logic at all, but arrange them in the proper way. Now, I know what you're going to say, dear Christian. You're going to say, ha ha, computers don't build themselves. It takes a designer to arrange things in a way that permits reason. Checkmate. <laughs> to which I have the following response. The reason computers don't build themselves, and the reason painters don't, paintings don't paint themselves, and buildings don't build themselves, is because those things are not made out of uh, molecules of material that self-replicate. Human beings are. DNA does exactly that. And as long as you have these three forces at play, reproduction, mutation, and selection, you're going to have increased functionality and uh, adaptiveness over time. That is exactly what we are. So if matter can produce thought, and we have replicating material that is selected for over time, who's to say we can't have a brain, or an eye, or a femur, or whatevs? But then the next thing we say is, if reason is only the product of unthinking matter, how do we know we can trust it? What other option do you have? <laughs> how else did you get to the conclusion of God's existence if not by reason? And if you didn't get there through reason, we have problems. <laughs> if you're going to tell me that reason is unreliable, how are you going to do that? If you ever utter the word because, you've just lost the argument. Then we get, but God speaks to me. And when I was a Christian, oh, I thought God spoke to me. And I thought he told me all kinds of nifty things about the stars and about gay people and about how much money I should give my local church. And dear Christian, when you say that God speaks to you, I think you're sincere. I really do. But I think you've taken this experience you have when you pray or when you think you're hearing God's voice, and I think you failed to look at the broader picture. Who does God speak? To whom does God speak? Or more, who, to whom does God not speak? God doesn't speak to every Hindu. Didn't speak to any Hindu throughout all of time. Every single Hindu who thought God was speaking to them was either lying, deluded, or crazy. God did not speak to every pagan for the same reasons, nor to every Muslim. Dear Christian, for your religion to be true, this must be the case. For your religion to be true, literally, Every single follower of every single other religion, literally every, almost every single other person who wanted to abide by God's will and who wanted to uncover the, the, uh, the definition of God and God's true nature was either lying, deluded, or crazy. They were victim to some flaw in psychology that allowed them to think God was speaking to them, but they were in error. Who else does God not speak to? God doesn't speak to... Andrea Yates, the devoutly Christian woman who uh, drowned her children because God told her so. Every time I bring up Andrea Yates to a Christian and explain what she did, they say, oh, no, 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 she wasn't really a Christian. <laughs> so even people who believe in Jesus can really believe God's speaking to them and be in error. God didn't speak to Daphne Spurlock, the devoutly Christian woman who slit her son's throat at the behest of God's voice. She was either lying, deluded, or crazy. God did not speak to Torquemada despite his faith in Jesus. He didn't speak to the Newmans who watched while their daughter Madeline died of type 1 diabetes. Lots of Christians, dear Christian, sincerely believe that God speaks to them just as much as you and are in error. So to whom did God speak? God spoke to Abraham. He didn't tell Daphne Spurlock to slit her son's throat, but he told Abraham to burn his son. If Andrea Yates failed, if Daphne Spurlock failed, so did Abraham. So did Jephthah. Dear Christian, you have to admit that there's some flaw in psychology that can allow every other believer ever, and even many Christians, to believe that God is speaking to them and be wholly mistaken. And if the starting probability 
is so high that someone who believes God is speaking to them is going to be in error, why not you? Why not all of you? When you tell me that those people aren't true Christians or that your beliefs are different, you know what I say? I don't care. I don't care that your beliefs are different. I care that your beliefs are more likely to be true, that they're more rational. And if they're not more likely to be true, if they're not more rational than the beliefs of Daphne Spurlock, of every other Hindu, of Abraham, then you are making the same moral failing. You have an obligation, as someone with good intentions, to make sure that your beliefs are supported by reason. It's not good enough merely to be different. And don't think for a second, dear Christian, that you've earned any slack from me or any other atheist just by pointing out how your beliefs are different. Because the difference that matters is how rational your beliefs are. And I don't see any reason to believe that your Jesus who rose from the dead is more rational to believe in than their Jesus who rose from the dead. How many of you ever got this one? But I feel God. Channeling Jerry DeWitt for a minute. Now, dear Christian, I believe that when you say you feel God, that you're sincere. I believe that you feel something. But like God speaking to you, I believe you haven't reasoned it through all the way. Because sometimes the input we get from our senses is not entirely reliable. And this is how optical illusions exist. I'm here to tell you right now that in this picture, square A and square B are the exact same color. If you don't believe me, just watch this. Now, I've given this talk elsewhere, and they say, well, the, the square changed as it, as it slid down. Let's try it this way. <laughs> They're the same color. And even when I take them away, they'll still look different to you. Because the God whose existence is a tribute to his perfection made you with a brain that has this flaw. A lot of times your senses have flaws. You know, when we're in the dark, we feel like there's other people watching us. I mean, the fact that our brain doesn't always tell us the right things is how magicians make their living. <laughs> they don't really saw the woman in half, all right? If you see them saw the woman in half, or if you see a magician disappear, what is more likely, that they're really magic or there's some natural explanation you just haven't thought of? So, if our senses don't always tell us the proper thing, how can we measure reality against our senses? What conclusions do we have to sometimes ignore our senses on? You might feel God speaking to you, but what is more likely? That a God who wants a relationship with you hasn't come and knocked on your front door, but instead gives you these fuzzy feelings when you pray that also occurs with Muslims, Hindus, everyone else, or that when you pray, and you feel important, and you feel like you're speaking to someone you love, even if it's in the confines of your brain, that you get warm, fuzzy feelings naturally. I mean, one of those is significantly more likely. And if you can admit that, dear Christian, there are some things you have to admit you might be deceived on by your senses. People don't rise from the dead. You will bury your loved ones when they die with no fear that they will reanimate. You believe this, and you believe that the universe is consistent, dear Christian. If you put your hand on a stove and burn the shit out of your hand one week, you're not going to come back the next week and put your hand on the same stove because you know, you know that the universe is consistent. If you believe that people don't rise from the dead like you do, you don't you, you can't possibly believe that 2,000 years ago, a guy rose from the dead and his only evidence was you know, the tales of other people who saw it and you need to listen to what they say. God could do better. People do not walk on water. Take it up with physicists if you think otherwise. Prayer is a crapshoot or God is malicious. God will answer the prayer that you find your keys in the morning but won't answer the prayer of a child starving million, thousands of miles away. Prayer is either a crapshoot or God has seriously mismanaged his moral priorities. <laughs> Biblical barbarity 
was never moral. Exodus 35, 2, kill anybody who works on Saturday. Now, dear Christian, what you'll say to me is Jesus came and the rules changed. But do you listen to yourself when you say that? Do you know what you're saying? You're saying that at one time, it was absolutely moral to kill someone for working on a particular day. How do you say that with a clear conscience, as if that exempts you, or if that exempts God from being wicked? It doesn't. That God never existed. Nobody could survive in the belly of a fish for three days. <laughs> People don't get converted into pillars of salt. Take it up with chemists if you think otherwise. Now, you have a trump card, dear Christian, that comes into play no matter what the evidence is, no matter how towering the mountain of evidence that people do not rise from the dead, you have a trump card, and it's faith. Doesn't matter what the evidence is. I have faith. Here's my question to you. Can you distinguish faith from gullibility? Is there any conclusion so outlandish, so ludicrously idiotic, so flagrantly at odds with reason that faith cannot be advanced in its defense. And if not, that should tell you, that should tell you the value of faith. If faith can support a conclusion that is in complete contradiction to reason, faith is useless. And if you're using faith to escape the burden of reason, and you believe that reason is a moral obligation, like I do, then faith, believing anything on faith, is a moral failing. And if you believe in God based on faith, you are, you are failing morally, not only to yourself, but to everybody else on this planet who has to be next to you and who may suffer from the product of your irrationality. Faith is not just merely wrong. It's not merely something that comforts you. It is a failing. It is a moral failing. It is an intellectual failing. And I'm not telling you this to just beat up on you. I'm telling you this because I believe you can do better. I be I'm telling you this because we're all on the same team down here. Not only sh can you do better, you should do better. Take my hand. If you can't bring yourself to believe that the tenets of your religion are rational, if you have doubts, those doubts are not Satan trying to worm his way in. They are a mind, that, they're the products of a mind that is curious about how the world works and wants to explore it to the full extent of your potential. And the moment you hand over your desires to love whoever you want, to touch someone in a certain way, or to think the thoughts about the world that your brain is screaming to get out, the second you hand those things over to a church, your religion has made you less happy than you would be otherwise. We don't want that from you. The atheist movement doesn't want that from you. Our message to you is that we understand. So many of us were once religious. We know how you feel, and we know how it feels to be scared. We know how it feels to wonder if we'll get ostracized by our families by coming out of the closet or by expressing our doubts that someone rose from the dead. We know how it feels to worry about losing our job if word of our atheism gets out or word of our doubts gets out. And believe me, we know what it feels like to feel like the only atheist in the world or to feel like the only person in the world who's having doubts, or to feel like, or to feel like we're failing God by asking the wrong questions. But if we're ever going to find God, it's going to be by indulging our curiosity to its full potential, not by deciding which thoughts we can or can't think. That's not how you discover the truth of this world. My message to you, dear Christian, whether you're in the pews wondering if your preacher is full of shit, whether when you're at home with your family you can't buy into them praying, you're not alone. 
Church is not the only place where people will accept you, and you don't have to be anything other than what you are to come to us. Right now, atheism is so ascendant in the United States. If you go to meetup.com, there are atheist groups in every town and every city in this country. There are huge conventions like Skepticon where you can come and network and meet other atheists and hear their stories and tell yours. God has abandoned you, but we have not. And all we, ever want, all we ever want from you is to try to be reasonable. It's something your church has never asked you for and never will ask you for. But there's freedom to it. There's freedom to understand how the stars work. There's freedom to think the thoughts that you think will land you in hell. There's freedom from the fear that your religion has put on you in that way. So many of us once thought that by indulging our curiosity and our doubts, we were betraying God. And finally, we worked up the courage to do it, and we realized there was nothing to ever be afraid of. We'll help you. Come to us. How many of you heard this argument? You have no evidence for love. You can't feel love. You can't touch love. You can't smell love. And God's kind of that way. But you believe in love, so why not God? Well, love is a state of the mind. Just like happiness or sadness. It's a feeling. And when people have particular states of the mind, they behave in a way that is indicative of that state of the mind. When someone is happy, they'll smile and laugh and be more generous. When they're sad, they'll cry, they'll frown. And when people love someone else, they behave in a particular way. Belief in God is a state of the mind. And we have so much evidence for it that no one denies that people believe in God. But God is not a state of the mind. God is a tangible thing that exists outside of the brain. As tangible as this, as tangible as this microphone. But the deal is, God has given us infinitely more evidence that this microphone exists than that he exists. Yet, which one is the more important fact? We have tons of evidence for states of the brain. And we have tons of evidence for love. And you can see it. Every time someone encounters someone who does more for making them want to be a good person than the threats or the empty promises of a god. Real love is based... Real love derives from qualities, from compassion, from kindness, from honesty. Those qualities are lovable. That's my girlfriend. <laughs> A lot of you who came to Skepticon last year know that God abandoned me. God made me with a brain that on many days is incapable of thinking I even look normal, let alone attractive. And that woman makes me feel beautiful. <laughs> Every single person in this room has evidence of love, infinitely more evidence than they have of any God, because we behave that way. We behave like we love one another. We behave like the people around us are important to us. When they're down, we pull them up. When they have cancer, we donate to their livelihood. And when you encounter someone like this, there are so many evidences of love. Dear Christian, you want evidence for love. I have evidence for love. There are real heavens, and there are real hells. But they're not the ones promised to us for all eternity. They're the heavens and the hells that we make for ourselves in this life. The one life that we get to experience for sure. They're the heavens and hells that Christians and atheists alike get to experience. And this woman gives me more heaven, or more access,
access to heaven than any belief about God ever did. More so than being on this stage. There is no heaven waiting for me. I've only got the heavens here. I only have these years made up of these days, made up of these minutes. And I want to spend them all with you. Will you marry me? Show me that kind of proof for God, and I will convert in a second. Thank you. I feel like I've grown up with this event. <laughs> I feel like I've grown up with a lot of you. I'm glad you guys got to be here for that. It meant a lot to me. <laughs> Almost got through without crying. I was this close. Every time JT speaks here, he makes us cry. <laughs> okay. uh, well. To follow that. You come to the wrong fucking place for sympathy. I don't want to follow Greta Christina even on Skype. <laughs> um, okay, break time. 